नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय नारायण नमस्कृत नरम शैव नरोत्तम देवी सरस्वती व्यास तथो जाय मुदीर नष्ट प्रायु अभद्रेशु भागवत सेवया भगवती श्लोके भक्ति भक्ति नैष्टी कृष्णाय वासुदेवाय देवकी नंदनाय नंदगोपकुमारा गोविंदा नमो नम नम पंकजनाभा पंकज मदिने नम पंकज मित्राय नमस्ते पंकज हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे So we will continue on <coughs> with the nectarian mellows of Sri Gopi Gita. We will continue from text four onwards. Om Ajnana Timiranta Sya Kyaana Jana Shalakaya Chakshuran Mulita Mena Tasmay Sri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Sri Mati Radha Nath Swami Niti Namine Nama Om Vishnu Padaya कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतल श्रीमते जय पताक स्वामी दिनामिने नमाचार्य पदाय निताय कृपा प्रदाय ने गौरकथाधामदाय नगर ग्राम तारिणे नमा विष्णु पदाय कृष्ण पृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदात स्वामी दिनामिने नमस्ते सरस्वती देवी गौरवाणी प्रचारिण निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्य देश तारिणे जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधर श्रीवासरी गौरव भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे रीडिंग फ्रॉम श्रीमद भागवतम चैप्टर टेन सॉरी कैंटर टेन चैप्टर थर्टी वन एंटाइटल्ड द गोपीज सॉन्ग्स ऑफ सेपरेशन reading from text 4 onwards <clears throat> text 4 nakalo go pika nandana bhava akhilo de translation you are not actually the son of the gopi yashoda a friend but rather the indwelling witness in the hearts of all embodied souls because lord brahma prayed for you to come and protect the universe you have now appeared in the shatvata dynasty <clears throat> so the gopis <clears throat> they are continuing they appeal to krishna to appear in front of them as we all know we uh, remember from our last um, you know narration of the previous three verses of the gopi gita that the gopis are actually crying 
in separation from Krishna <coughs> because Krishna has disappeared from the Rasa dance. He has even disappeared from Srimati Radharani herself also. And the gopis are much more worried that Srimati Radharani is in anxiety in separation from Krishna than their own personal anxiety. And that is the same for even Srimati Radharani. The reason why Srimati Radharani, as we explained before, that the reason why she, you know, made Krishna also go away by, ex you know, exhibiting external pride, Krishna left, even Srimati Radharani, because Radharani was not feeling nice that all of her gopi friends were bereft of Krishna's association and that she was the only unique person with whom Krishna was. So Srimati Radharani could not make her gopi friends feel that anxiety in separation from Krishna. So out of her most supreme, you know, motherly compassion, Srimati Radharani let go of her own personal happiness so that she can also be along with the gopis and appeal to Krishna to reappear in front of all of them. That is the magnanimity of Srimati Radharani. And, <clears throat> of course, before starting, you know, this text four onwards today, I'd again like to say that I'm definitely not qualified speak on these very esoteric subject matter, but um, I will just try to repeat what I have heard from Srila Prabhupada and what I have heard from the disciples of Srila Prabhupada. So praying and begging all of you to kindly um, bless me so we can understand these esoteric verses spoken by Srimati Radharani and the gopis in the proper mood and <clears throat> and cherish our own, and nourish our own devotional life. So, text four, <clears throat> the gopis are actually directly claiming <clears throat> to Krishna that they are saying that, Krishna, we know who you are. That you have, you have, you know, just right now, you have appeared as the son of Mother Jashoda. But you're not restricted to just be the son of Mother Jashoda. You are not an ordinary person. We know that very well, that you are indeed the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is, you know, Swarat. He is Abhigya. He is, you know, all-pervasive. You don't have to be bound to just, you know, one gopi, or you, you're not bound to, you know, just be in, the, in one particular dynasty. Nothing can bind you. You are completely independent. And the purpose for which you have come, Krishna, what is the purpose that you have come here this time? You came because Lord Brahma headed, you know, headed, you know, all the de devatas. They came to you. They begged you to come and save Mother Earth. And that is the reason why you came. That is the reason, that is the sole purpose of your coming down is Paritranaya Sadhunam, to deliver the pious. And by the way, Vinashaya Chadushkritam. And as a, you know, as a side effect, you will also destroy the miscreants. But the main purpose for which you have come is to give pleasure to your devotees. That is why you have come. You have come to protect your devotees and to give pleasure to your devotees. So what are you doing right now? You have disappeared from us. You are giving us so much anxiety. We are crying in your separation. And you don't even care, Krishna. So the gopis are rebuking Krishna in this manner, that what your purpose for coming your purpose for coming is to protect your devotees and to give pleasure to your devotees, but you are doing against it. You are going against it. You are doing the opposite, Krishna. How can you do this? Lord Brahma has called you. You know, for the gopis, 
in this uh, particular um, Gopi Gita, there is, you know, in this particular verse, the Gopis are glorifying Lord Brahma. That glorifying means making him an aid to support their um, their uh, conviction that Krishna has come to protect the devotees. So Brahma is like right now on their side. He's a friend right now for the gopis. But later on in the verses, we see that they even rebuke even Lord Brahma. Why? Because he being the creator has created the eyelashes, which, you know, keep blinking, and it impedes them from seeing Krishna in one drishti, without blinking, they actually want to see Krishna. But they're cursing Lord Brahma that, why did you create eyelids for us? You being the creator, why did you do this? So like this, the gopis, they are, you know, they've used Lord Brahma in various situations to show their ultimate attachment to Krishna, how much they are deeply attached to Krishna, that they know that Krishna is indeed the Supreme Personality of God, that He is supremely independent. He is, you know, Swarat. He is the Swarat Supreme Person. But still, still, He has appeared for a purpose. And right now, the very fact that Krishna has disappeared from them is going against that purpose. So that is the main purport of this particular verse. And in the purport also, it is explained that the gopis here are implying, since you have descended to protect the entire universe, how can you neglect your own devotees? So this is the complaint that the gopis are giving, and they are quoting Lord Brahma, that, you know, even the creator, Lord Brahma himself, has come to, you know, he has brought you down for this purpose and you are going completely against it, Krishna. It is not fair. So this is their um, complaint to Krishna and their appeal to appear in front of them. As, as is told by His Holiness Srila Radha Govinda Maharaj, when he starts the Gopi Gita, Maharaj says that ye gopiyon ka geet nahi hai, ye gopiyon ka krandan hai. This is not just a mere song that the, the gopis have sung in separation from Krishna, but they have literally poured their hearts out. They have literally, you know, just, they are just crying in separation from Krishna. So we need to understand this very uh, mood of the gopis and Srimati Radharani and then we will be able to appreciate each and every word of the Gopi Gita. Moving on to text 5. <laughs> of fortune grants fearlessness to those who approach your feet out of fear of material existence. O oh lover, please place that wish-fulfilling wish lotus hand on our heads. So this is a very, very, you know, very beautiful verse where the gopis are glorifying Krishna's lotus hands and his lotus feet. Uh, mostly his lotus hands in this particular verse, because they are saying that virachita abhayam, that um, his hands are granting fearlessness. Your lotus-like hands, they grant fearlessness. Because, 
Why do they grant fearlessness? Because by taking shelter of Krishna, you know, Krishna is always holding on to the hands of the goddess of fortune. And when anybody, any any particular soul, when, you know, they approach the lotus feet of Krishna, you know, by giving up material existence, that lotus hand grants fearlessness to that particular soul. So the gopis are pleading to Krishna that, please, place that wish-fulfilling hand on our head, Krishna. So it's basically just the way that the gopis are, you know, in different forms, in different ways. They're just begging Krishna that, please, Krishna, come. Come in front of us. You know, in this regard, the lotus hand of Krishna is glorified. And I was... um, just yesterday I was reading this very beautiful book um, which is called as Sri Krishna Nika Kaumudi. It is actually um, written by Srila Kavi Karnapura who is um, one of the three glorious sons of um, Shivananda Sen. And, you know, the way Kavi Karnapura <clears throat> the way he describes some of the pastimes, the intimate pastimes of Sri Sri Radha and Krishna and the relationship of Krishna and the Gopas, Krishna and the Gopis, Krishna with his parents, Nandajan Jashoda and Mother Rohini. It is, it is so beautiful. It is so deep. And over there, there is one mention um, of Krishna's lotus hands, which, you know, now when I read this particular verse, glorifying the lotus hand of Krishna, by the mercy of Kavi Karnapura, I can, you know, I'm able to um, just remember this particular anecdote that I read from Krishna Nika Kaumudi. I want to share with all of you. It is explained there that when Krishna, um, before he goes into the forest, Krishna actually eats a complete meal um, before he goes into the forest. Mother Jashoda, she begs Srimati Radharani to come. And, uh, you know, because Radharani was blessed by Durvasa Muni, that whatever Srimati Radharani will cook will be nectarian. It will be pure nectar, amrita, and that anybody who eats uh, anything cooked by Srimati Radharani will never fall sick. So Durvasa Muni actually gave this benediction to Srimati Radharani so that Mother Jashoda would hear this, you know, and she would allow Srimati Radharani to come and, you know, invite her to come to cook for Krishna every day. So the Vata Muni here was used as a beautiful instrument to unite the divine couple in um, in their loving exchanges. So every day, so actually after hearing this, um, word, you know, this benediction that the Vata Muni gave to Srimati Radharani, this became, you know, very, very famous all over Brajamandal that everybody in Brajamandal knew that Srimati Radharani's hands are transcendental and whatever she cooks is pure nectar, is just amrita and that anybody who eats whatever she cooks, they can never fall sick. So this you know, news, it, spelled, it, it just spread like wildfire all over Braj and Mata Jashoda. She heard it. And Mother Jashoda, she was always so concerned about her dearly beloved son that every day someone or the other is always attacking my baby Krishna. He is always in so much of, you know, difficulty. Somebody just comes, you know, wind blows him away. The chariot tries to kill him. So many different things happen to Krishna, my dear baby, every single day. So then Mother Jashoda went with a humble appeal to Mother Kirtida Sundari and came to Mother Kirtida Sundari and said that, please, I beg you that whatever happens, I want Sri Radhe to come to Nandagao every day and cook for my dearly beloved Krishna. 
And Mother Kirti, that she just agreed. You know, she couldn't refuse the heartfelt appeal of Mother Jashoda. So every morning, Mother Jashoda, she would send a caravan and to bring Srimati Radharani from Barshana to Nandagaon. And Srimati Radharani would come with her celebrated gopis, you know, assisted by them, by Lalita Vishakha. Indulekha, Champakalata, Tungavidya, Rangadevi Sudevi, Suchitra, everybody would come and they would all assist Srimati Radharani and very expertly within a matter of couple of hours Srimati Radharani and the gopis would cook a a huge feast for Krishna every single day and they were very expert and very very fast and the glory of their cooking was that Srimati Radharani would never repeat. If she's cooking something today, she would never repeat it tomorrow. And she would make Krishna eat everything, you know, different every single day. That is the glory of Srimati Radharani. So it is so amazing the way she would cook and the gopis would, with, you know, so much, you know, expertise, they would all come together and they would assist Srimati Radharani in cooking a fantastic meal for Krishna, and they would not just cook for Krishna, but they would actually cook for all the Gopa friends of Krishna, for Lord Balaram, for Nanda Maharaj, for Jashoda Mata, for you know Mother Rohini, for everybody they would cook. So they would cook a huge feast every single morning. So when Krishna, he would you know wake up hearing the fragrant smells coming from the kitchen, coming because of the lotus hands of Srimati Radharani, and that fragrance would drive Krishna crazy. He would get up and he would quickly get dressed, and then he would come. And he would come and sit on the dining table. Mother Jashoda and Mother Rohini would bring the two boys, Krishna and Balaram. They would come and sit on the dining table with Nanda Maharaj. Nanda Baba was there, and then all the Gopas would also come because they would come because, you know, of course they want to eat with Krishna, but then after eating, they all have to go out into the forest to, um, you know, graze the cows, so they would come. So then Krishna would invite all the Gopas to also sit around in the dining table, and all of them would start enjoying the prasad. And when you know, Krishna would, you know, the plate would come in front of Krishna. Krishna would feel, you know, it is said that the, the prasad would be so, you know, um, fulfilling that just by looking at the way Srimati Radharani has decorated Krishna's plate, Krishna would be completely satisfied. There would be no amount of hunger left in Krishna just by seeing, having darshan of the beautiful love uh, the way Srimati Radharani has served each and every item on Krishna's plate. So then, it is said that Krishna actually washes his lotus hands before he starts to eat. And this is what I wanted to say, that whenever I think of lotus hand of Krishna, this particular scene, which is described so beautifully by Srila Kavikarnapura, comes to mind. And it is explained that as soon as water is poured on Krishna's lotus palms, Krishna collects it, it seems like as if mirror, a mirror has fallen on the, um, you know, on, on a, it, it actually, um, it is, because Krishna's lotus hands, they are red. And the water that is falling on Krishna's hand, that collects in Krishna's hand, it turns red from the radiance of the lotus palm of Krishna. And everybody is so mesmerized who are sitting around Krishna, the Gopas, and Nanda Baba, and Mother Jashoda. They are just so mesmerized that it looks as if Krishna's hand, he's holding something very, very reddish in his hand. And it is moving. That that scene is just so amazing that, you know, the way the water falls on Krishna's lotus hands, his reddish lotus palm, it is like the water also turns red. And when Krishna drops that um, water from his lotus hands, everyone can see the auspicious symbols that are present 
on Krishna's lotus hands. It is so beautifully described. So, and then of course Krishna starts eating um, all the different items and it is explained that when Krishna starts eating one item after the other, he feels completely satisfied. You know, he doesn't feel like going to the next item because the one item that he is currently eating, it is so nurturing. He is completely satisfied, but then he feels, no, no, maybe this item I really have to try. Sri Radhe has cooked so lovingly for me, so I definitely need to try. So then when Krishna takes that you know, item, he tastes that, then he feels, oh, this is so good, this is so better. And then he, you know, for every item, he feels that same way, that it is better than the previous one. So like this, Krishna's lotus hands, he tastes with his lotus hands, he put every morsel uh, that is presented to him, he takes every morsel that is presented on his plate by Srimati Radharani, and he relishes the nectar that Srimati Radharani has cooked. So, just wanted to share this very beautiful leela of Krishna honoring uh, Srimati Radharani's love in the form of her cooking. Moving on to text 6. Vraja Janatihanu Nijajana smaya dhunsana smita bhaja sakhe bhavat kinkarismano jalaruhananam Translation O oh, you who destroy the suffering of Raja's people, O oh, hero of all women, your smile shatters the false pride of your devotees. Please, dear friend, accept us as your maid servants and show us your beautiful lotus face. So here the gopis, they are saying to Krishna that, Krishna, we very well know that you have left us because we became proud. That the gopis know very, very well that Krishna, he can tolerate anything. He can tolerate anything and everything. But if any of the devotees of Krishna becomes proud... Krishna will go to any extent to curb his pride, to destroy his pride. Krishna will go to any extent. We know what he did with Indra, how Krishna, he shattered the pride of Indra by lifting Sri Giriraj Govardhan Maharaj. He just lifted Govardhan Hill, gave shelter to all the Brajabasis for seven days and seven nights. And then Indra realized his huge blunder that he made. Similarly, Krishna also shattered the pride of Lord Brahma himself when Lord Brahma stole the calves and the little boyfriends of Krishna. He destroyed Lord Brahma's pride as well. Here, the gopis realize that, yes, Krishna, we very well know that you can tolerate everything but pride. Pride is something that Krishna will, you know, does not, tolerate. You know, there is something called inflated ego. Um, inflated ego is when we think great of oneself, you know, that, oh, look, I can do something which nobody else can do. Look at the way I do Arti. Look at the way I speak on Krishna's topics. Everyone is, you know, glorifying me. This is what we think in our heart when we are, you know, giving very good classes. And, you know, that's the pride. We are inflated that look at us by, you know, by the potency that we have and the power of our speech. We are able to speak like this. And everyone is so happy. So somehow I am making everybody happy. I am serving these devotees like nobody else. 
Look at the way I'm serving. That is pride. That is inflated pride. There is another kind of pride also, which is called as deflated pride. Deflated pride is when we think, oh, I'm not doing anything. I cannot do anything. I am so fallen. I am so sinful. I cannot do anything. I am not capable of anybody's mercy. I cannot do any service properly. And we mistake this deflated pride as humility. But humility, what is the actual description of humility? Humility does not mean that, you know, we say, oh, yes, I'm very fallen, I'm very sinful, I cannot do any service, I'm not qualified for anything, I don't even, you know, deserve anything. Is that really humility? But humility actually is, the definition of humility is to not think less about oneself or less of oneself, sorry. Humility is not to think less of oneself, but rather humility is to think less about oneself. It means that when we stop thinking about I, let's take this I out of the equation, whether it be I in an inflated way or a deflated way. Let's get this I out of the equation and replace it with Krishna. That is real humility. When we start thinking about Krishna more and less about ourselves, that is humility. We should not just think that, oh yes, I'm fallen, I'm fallen, I'm fallen. You know, one time Srila Prabhupada said, okay, you are fallen, so what are you doing about it? So we should know that, yes, it is important for us to feel that, yes, I'm not qualified for, you know, doing any services. But if that is just what we are concentrating on, aren't we concentrating too much on ourselves? That I am this, I am that, whether it be in the the inflated sense or the deflated sense. We are again becoming I conscious rather than Krishna conscious. So when we think about Krishna, when we think about other devotees, about how we can really perfect our lives when we are serving other devotees for their pleasure, when we are serving the senior devotees, when we are serving every devotee for their pleasure, then that is actual humility. Srila Prabhupada is very, 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 you know, um, apt in following this principle. Srila Prabhupada, he always took that I out of the equation and he always replaced it with Krishna. And Srila Prabhupada showed us how we can truly follow the principle of, or the guideline of utility is the principle. You know, when we really truly do that, then that is actual genuine humility. So, again, humility is to take out I from the equation to think less about oneself, not of oneself. And uh, let's think more on about Krishna. Let's think more about service to the devotees. That will be a success of life. And then automatically all the good qualities will be naturally manifest in ourselves. We don't have to do special striving to achieve devotional perfection, it will automatically come. So here, the gopis are saying to Krishna that, Krishna, we accept that we did become very, very proud that you are dancing with us and us alone and that you could not tolerate that pride and you left us. But Krishna, we are realizing our mistake. So, you know, you always come to the aid whenever Vraja's people, you know, the Brajbasis, whenever they're suffering, you're immediately there even before they start calling out to you. Here, I, we know we made a mistake, Krishna, but, and we are rectifying our mistake. We promise that we'll never be proud again. But please, please accept us as your maidservants and 
Show us your beautiful uh, smiling lotus face. It is explained that Krishna's smita, his smita, Nija Jana Smaya Dhamsana Smita, that Krishna's smile, his very elegant smile. You know, Smita is said that it is just, uh, um, you know, when the lips just expand and your teeth is not shown. That is called as Smita. That kind of smile <clears throat> is called as Smita. So Krishna's smile destroys all pride. So they are saying that Krishna, yes, our pride has gone. Trust me, it has gone. It is shattered. And we are begging you that come in front of us with your beautiful lotus face, with that smile decorated on your lotus face, so that even the little possibility of you know, any pride coming up will be immediately destroyed just by looking at your smita. So that is the you know way the gopis are appealing to Krishna to appear in front of them. Moving on to text seven. Pranata dehinam papakshanam trinacharanugam. of fortune. Since you once put those feet on the hoods of the great serpent Kaliya, please place them upon our breasts and tear away the lust in our hearts. Here, this is actually one of my very, very, very dear verses of the Gopi Gita. This is one of my most favorite ones, this text 7. Because here the glorification that the gopis are giving, <clears throat> the way they are glorifying Krishna, it is really, really um, heart touching, very, 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 very compelling. And I remember the way Srila Radha Govinda Maharaj gave his purport to this particular verse. I will try to repeat as I have heard from Maharaj. So Maharaj is saying that pranata dehinam apakarshanam that hey Krishna your lotus feet have the potency of attracting all papa papa akarshanam that you you are just capable of your lotus feet is actually capable of attracting all sinful activities, sinful reactions. That is the potency of your lotus feet. And what does that lotus feet do? Trinacharanugam Sri Niketanam. That lotus feet, which is actually the abode of Sri, Sri Niketanam, it is the abode of the goddess of fortune. Because Lakshmi Devi is always residing at the lotus feet of Sri Krishna. She is always massaging the lotus feet of Krishna. So that lotus feet of Krishna is actually the abode of Sri, of Lakshmi Devi. Imagine, her home is Krishna's lotus feet. So Sri Niketanam. And that Sri Niketanam, where is it going? Trinacharanugam. Trina means grass. Trinachar means cows, animals. 
but actually graze on the grass. Trina char. Charna matlab to graze. And trina means grass. So trina char, the cows and the, you know, the buffaloes, all of those animals who graze on the grass are called as trina char. And Krishna is trina char anugami. Anugami means follower. You know, we say Rupanuga, Srila Prabhupada Anuga. Anuga means to follow. So Krishna is Trinachara Anuga. Who is Krishna following? Krishna is following this Trinachar. Trinachar, now if you notice this, Maharaj explains so beautifully, he says that Trinachar Matlab, what they do is, they walk in the front, and Krishna walks behind the Trinachar. He is, he is their follower. And when the Trinachar are going in the front, what do they go? Do they just simply walk? No. When they are walking, they actually keep eating the grass on the way. So they were, and when you, if you've ever seen um, the way the cows or any animal, when they eat the grass, they actually take the grass which is on the top the soft, nice grass. So they just eat it, and they don't eat it in such a, it's not a clean, you know, uh, sweep that they do. It's um, after they finish eating, you know, the the roots of the the grass, you know, it is exposed. And it is very, very difficult to step on those roots because it really hurts the feet. And Krishna, he is actually walking on the half-eaten grass, which is exposing the root, and Krishna is stepping on this particular, you know, hard, you know, root of the grass, and it is hurting his lotus feet so much. And that is actually painful to Sri Lakshmi Devi, because it is, that lotus feet is her abode. And that her abode is in pain, she, her heart really bleeds out. Seeing that, seeing that, you know, when Krishna is walking behind these animals, behind the cows, Krishna is stepping on this half-eaten grass, which is very, very hard. It is very, very, you know, it, it like pierces. So when I had first heard this explanation by Srila Radha Govinda Maharaj, I really was not able to, you know, um, I accepted it. Of course, I accepted it. But I experienced it when um, in 2016, we were very, very fortunate to be able to, you know, Srimati Radharani and the Masi of the Vaishnavas, the Masi of the Guru Vargas, we were allowed to perform the Braja Mandal Parikrama, the 30-day walking pilgrimage. And when we were walking one day, we, the first day that, you know, first time, actually, not the first day, the first time we were walking through some fields, and, you know, those fields, they had used a machine to cut out the grass, and the roots were still there, and they had become so hard, and we had to step on those roots, and I was immediately reminded of this particular verse. And when, you know, you step on that, it really is like a sword, you know, piercing through your feet. So I was thinking, my God, Krishna, he willingly used to go, you know, behind these cows on after they have eaten the soft grass on the top, revealing the hard root at the bottom, and Krishna would step on these hard roots. And Krishna's lotus feet is soft like lotus petals. And what, how much pain Krishna would have, but Krishna would experience bliss. Because he is, you know, he would feel very, very uh, amazing that he is actually a Trinacharanuga. He would feel just like how we feel so fortunate to be Srila Prabhupada Nugas, to be the followers of Srila Prabhupada. Similarly, Krishna would actually feel very, very fortunate and blessed that he is a Trinacharanuga. And therefore, his happiness was so much that this 
pain of stepping on this half-eaten grass was nothing. It would not never hurt Krishna. Krishna would not feel the hurt. But Krishna's devotees, his devotees, the gopis and Sri Lakshmi Devi, they, their hearts would bleed to see Krishna undergoing these kind of tribulations. So this is the meaning of the second line of Trinacharanugam Sri Niketanam. The third line says, Fani Fanarkitam Te Padambujam. Hey Krishna, your Pada Ambuja means, Ambuja means lotus, and Pada means feet. So Te Padambujam, your lotus feet. What did you do with that lotus feet again? Firstly, you became a Trinacharanuga. Then the second thing, which is explained in the third line, is you you are also known as Fani Fanar Pitam. When you danced on the hoods of Kaliya, destroying his pride by every kick that you gave on his hood, you were, you know, making Kaliya bleed out all his poisonous effects, and you purified Kaliya. You did not kill Kaliya. You know, Krishna killed every demon that he came in contact with, but Krishna destroyed the demoniac nature within Kaliya. He took out all the poison from Kaliya and banished Kaliya from Vrindavan. But he delivered Kaliya. He made Kaliya become free from all of his poisonous um, you know, nature. So did Kaliya ask for it? Did Kaliya say, yes, yes, Krishna, come, come, please come, I'm begging you to purify me. Please come and dance on my uh, hoods and purify me. Kaliya did not beg that. In fact, Kaliya was fighting with you. He was, you know, repulsive. He was angry with you. But why did you come to his territory? But what did you do? Your lotus feet, you arpitam, funny fana, Arpitam. Arpitam means you offered. Kaliya didn't ask for it. But Aapne Apne Charano ko Arpan kiya. Arpan matlab you offered your lotus feet to this Kaliya. And here Krishna, for so many times, so many, you know, in so many ways, here we, your maidservants, we are begging you to put your lotus feet upon our chest and you are not heeding to our request. This is the complaint of the gopis. That here you became with your lotus feet, you are following the Trinacharas. They have not told you to follow them, but you are still doing that. Kaliya didn't ask for your lotus feet. Still you went and offered your lotus feet to Kaliya and took care of him, you know, delivered him. But here we, your maid servants, krinu kucheshuna, krindhi richayam, that, you know, please, we are, we are helplessly begging you, Krishna, that please put your lotus feet upon our chest. And, you know, our chest, we understand that it is neither the hoods of Kaliya, nor the half-eaten, you know, hard root of the leftover grass. Our chest is more hard than that, you know, grass and Kaliya's hoods also. It is very, very poisonous. We know that. But still, Krishna, we are begging you, we are pleading that please put your lotus feet on our chest and fulfill our desire. So this is the appeal that the gopis are doing to Krishna. So with this, we will end here today, and we will continue on from text 8 onwards. Shri Shri Gopi Gita Ki Jai, Shri La Prabhupada Ki Jai, Iskan Vartaman Guru Vrinda Ki Jai. If there's any questions, comments, or realizations, we can take that now. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much for this really wonderful class. <clears throat> uh, I actually have so many questions, <laughs> if you allow, or if yes. time allows. Yeah. <clears throat> um, you know, you just finished saying how Krishna was in bliss, you know, walking behind the cows who ate this half in grass. 
um, who, you know, have ate the grass. You know, and you use, and when you were explaining why, you use a Sanskrit term. So I didn't understand what was the cause of that bliss and falling behind and his feet getting pricked like that. Oh, okay. Because Krishna, he is the lover of the cows. And because he loves the cows so much, you know, whatever, he, he actually prides himself in, you know, being the follower of the cows. So out of love for the cows, Krishna does not feel the pain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I got that from context, but <laughs> I was just trying to make sure this was mm-hmm. the understanding was. Okay, and also, um, um, when you were describing um, Krishna's lotus hands, mm-hmm. you know, and how they give that reddish glow to the water mm-hmm. that's um, poured on them. Well, for mm-hmm. one thing, the, the water in that leela that's being poured on his hands so that he can wash his hands, or why? Yes, yeah, yeah, okay. that's why the that, water is poured. Excuse me? That's why the water was poured, so that Krishna could wash his hands before uh-huh. he starts eating. So. And, yeah, okay. And so when you were describing this, I think at that time you mentioned the... You were trying to describe something special. And I think at that time you were, um, this, you know, you were referencing the, the symbols on his hands. So at that point, I, I feel like I missed something. I mean, you were describing, like, the, you know, the reddish glow mm-hmm. that his hands gave the water, mm-hmm. and then you said something about the symbols on his hands. Uh, well, I didn't go into details of the symbol of Krishna's hands because mm-hmm. the symbols that are present on Krishna's lotus hands and lotus feet, that is an entire seminar in itself. Oh, but yes, I know. The, the yeah. auspicious markings that are present in Krishna's lotus hands, I just mentioned that when Krishna would pour the water down, you know, when the water is poured in his hand for washing, he would wash it, and then he would pour it down. So when he would pour it down, everybody present would get to see the auspicious markings on Krishna's lotus hand, which uh-huh. is, you know, that his fingertips, his, actually his um, right fingertips, it is said that all five of them have the marking of a conch shell, his left fingertips have the marking of um, chakra, Sudarshan chakra. Um, his right hand has um, club, flag, I think, Sudarshan chakra. He has a sword. He has the elephant gold. Um, left hand has lotus, umbrella, a fish, half moon, like these, you know, many, many symbols, very auspicious mm-hmm. symbols, and each of them have a very special meaning why mm-hmm. they are present. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I just mentioned that, you know, these auspicious symbols would become very visible to everyone when uh-huh. Krishna would wash his hands and his lotus hands would just be, you know, visible for everyone to take darshan like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And also, um, this, this, I wonder if you could just spell this word smita for me. When Krishna smiles, but mm-hmm. his teeth doesn't show, is that S-M-I-T-A? Yes, smita, yes. Okay. And I think just the last thing for me is, um, you know, in the, in the beginning of your talk, um, It seems as though when Krishna, when the gopis are kind of like chastising Krishna for not appearing before them and making them suffer in this way, Mm. there seems to be some references to him as God. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I'm trying to reconcile that with the fact that, you know, the Bajbasis really don't see him in this way at all. There's like, you know, maybe somewhere deep inside they might have some awareness, but it's so far removed. You know, they're so oblivious to the fact that he's God. Right. You know? Right. So, so that they could 
have, you know, enjoy their um, relationship with him, this kind of relationship with him. So that's mm-hmm. why I'm trying to reconcile that with, with the relationship. This, well, this see, the, uh-huh. thing is, the thing is that here the gopis are actually trying to appeal and appease Krishna. So it's not that the gopis or the brajbasis, they are, you know, they are oblivious. I mean, they actually don't even care that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. They just love him unconditionally. You know, Mm -hmm. being the Supreme Personality of Godhead is not a criteria for them to love Krishna. Um, Having said that, but they do know his position. They do know that. Um, and, And the very fact that they are quoting that Krishna has come as, you know, as an appeal to Lord Brahma's request. And, you know, so they're actually just quoting all of this to make him, you know, realize that, okay, Krishna, we understand your position, but we are still begging you to look at us, you know, as your maidservants, as your lovers, and please come in front of us. I mean, that's just like a a supporting Mm -hmm. statement, you know, like um, one time I heard this analogy uh, of course, La Prabhupada gave this very, very, very vividly that the mother of the president doesn't care that, you know, her son is the president. She will not come in and say, oh, Mr. President, and not deal yeah. with him as Mr. Yeah. President. She will never do that. But yeah. she knows that, yes, her son is the president. So sometimes if she wants certain things, Mm-hmm. from her son, she might say, well, you're the president, you're able to give it, why not yeah. for me too, you know? That just uh-huh. might be a way of her to, you know, appease to her yeah. son, you know? So yeah, that's the, same mood, a, the same a mood in which gopis are doing it, because um, they don't really care that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Using it to, you know, help in... Um, making their appeal to Krishna. It's like that. Yeah, it's like a, they're, they're just using everything, just maybe out of desperation, just any, using any reason, right, to get him yeah. to come. Maybe. Yes. Oh, that, thank you. That's very nice. Oh, actually, I know that I said that was the last one, but I just thought of just one last thing. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Um, that <clears throat> I wonder if you could distinguish because we as obviously the gopis um their love for krishna is beyond anything that we can conceive so you know what to speak of their purity <clears throat> so can you in light of this fact can you just distinguish between their pride and our pride because obviously krishna was not chastising them for having our kind of contaminated pride, you know. Right. So, you know, why, you know, why was he chastising their pride? Because their pride was transcendental. Correct. Right? It's not like ours. So, um, just trying to understand their pride versus our pride, and why he would chastise them for it like this. Okay. Very good. Very good question. The thing that is explained is that. When we become proud, it is because of our own, um, you know, uh, we feel superior in whatever way. You know, uh, like I was talking about deflated and inflated Mm -hmm. uh, pride that comes in us. And that is to prove our greatness over everybody else. You know, that we are, you know, the greatest. And it is out of envy, it is out of envy towards everybody else. The root cause of our pride is envy. And the root cause of the so-called pride of the gopis is nothing but pure love. That is the difference. The gopis also ex- exhibit anger towards Krishna. They, you know, it's, it's a rasa in itself, their, their transcendental anger towards Krishna. But that anger is also out of pure love for Krishna. It is not for <clears throat> their selfish desires, no. It is, it is completely transcendental because it is driven with love. Love is the bottom line. So even their pride, their so-called pride, it was because of their unconditional love for Krishna. 
And that is the difference. Our pride is driven by envy. The nitya siddhas, the nitya badhas are, you know, driven by envy. And the nitya siddhas, they are driven by love. That is the difference. Mm-hmm. And so the reason why Krishna would chastise them, even though it was out of love, is just for is just for the sake of um, to increase separation. Their, to increase their love. It is said mm-hmm. that you know after vipralampa, the sambhoga or the union is much more sweeter. You know when there is vipralampa, yes. when there is separation. You know, it is said that, in fact, separation is much more sweeter than even Sambhoga because in Vipralambha, there is the hope of Sambhoga. <clears throat> but in Sambhoga, there is always the hope of Vipralambha because after Sambhoga, again, Vipralambha would come back. So, therefore, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when uh, he, he taught us, you know, service in separation, that what is the actual mellow, in service and separation because the gopis are actually always in this particular mood even when they're in sambhoga they're actually in vipralamba so therefore vipralamba is actually the highest which Sri man chaitanya mahaprabhu displayed which la Prabhupada so easily gave to us you know what we are continuing right now even though shla Prabhupada is not physically present with us is because of our love to shla Prabhupada. We are doing what we are doing is because we, somehow or the other, we are in love with Srila Prabhupada. We are grateful to Srila Prabhupada. So we are continuing what we are doing. So this is Vipralamba Seva, service in separation. So we are all in training for service in separation. Mm-hmm. Okay. I really appreciate all that you've given us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mataji, for your very, very beautiful questions. Thank you. Hare Krishna, Mataji, Dhanu, Pranam, Shira Prabhupada, Kijaya Guru Maharaj. Very nice class, very nectar in uh, narration, Mataji. Uh, just at the end, you mentioned that uh, uh, Kalia, he he uh, didn't have any, um, he didn't invite or he fought even or uh, he didn't ask any mercy, but still Krishna, he offered his lotus feet on mm-hmm. his head. So what is the qualification of the Kaliya or what is the reason that he got that mercy? <laughs> Very good question. <laughs> well, um, you know, Kaliya, I actually... Um, don't know so much the history of Kaliya, that who he was in his previous life, um, and why Krishna gave this much mercy to Kaliya, um, where you know every demon Krishna killed, you know was really, <clears throat> you know they had history. Every one of them have a history, but Kaliya's <clears throat> only history is that he had a fight with uh, Garuda, and. Uh, the only place that he could stay secure was this Vrindavan because Garuda could not enter Vrindavan Dham. And uh, that's why um, uh, Kaliya had seeked shelter of Vrindavan Dham. And, you know, when he seeked shelter of Vrindavan Dham, he actually became very, very proud of, you know, um, that he is the Adipatya, you know, he was the all in all and he started, you know, poisoning the waters of the Jamuna and, you know, inflicting misery upon the Brajabasis, even the cows and the cowherd boys and everybody. And when Krishna saw that, he actually also wanted to resolve the differences, it is explained by Prabhupada, that he wanted to resolve the differences between Kaliya and Garuda. And um, because... Krishna, he doesn't want Garuda to also have any kind of uh, inimical relationship with anyone. So because Garuda is a very dear devotee, you know, he is Krishna's vahana, you know, in that sense. So in that sense, Krishna did not want Garuda to also have any kind of inimical relationship with anybody. So to resolve that, you know, he made sure that he is giving his mercy to Kaliya. And that's the reason why he actually danced on the hoods of Kaliya, 
so that Krishna's lotus feet would imprint on Kaliya's hood. And um, when Krishna told Kaliya to leave Jamuna and to go to the um, ocean, Kaliya said that I can't leave Vrindavan, you know, I'll stay here and I will continue on, but I promise I won't uh, poison anymore. But then Krishna said, no, you have to go. And uh, I promise that Garuda won't harm you because he's going to see my lotus feet impression on your hood and he will not do anything to you. So you go. So that's how Krishna just sent Kaliya away. <clears throat> so what I read from the Krishna book and the reason why Krishna did this was also Prabhupada explains that he did it so that Garuda doesn't, you know, he also resolves his animosity with Kaliya. He had several, you know, animosity with Kaliya, and Krishna can't tolerate that, you know, devotees have um, anything other than cordial relationships amongst each other. So, you know, that's what I can say, but if there's any... And uh, then other, we can say also you, because uh, the um, Kaliya's wife, they also um, pray. Plead. Yes, of course, of so course. That Krishna is and just to please that is, the devotees. That, Yes, that is definitely there. That they requested that mm -hmm. uh, Kaliya be left, and uh, Krishna always listens to his devotees. So that is definitely there. Very good point, Mother. Just to please, Mother, to um, please his devotees or to uh, shelter mercy on his devotee, he he uh, uh, put the uh, feet on Kaliya's. Had you know to please Garuda basically no? yeah. right. to make sure that Garuda's animosity mm. towards Kaliya yeah. is yes so that he can become friendly with Kaliya. <laughs> okay, thank so you. That, uh, the the you know what the verse we were reading mm. yesterday that Krishna always is very very fond of friendly relationships amongst his devotees. That's what Krishna likes. So. You know, Krishna can go up to any extent to make this fulfilled, you know, um, that he wants to see that everybody is very much unitedly serving, um, you know, together they're serving Krishna. That's what Krishna is most happy. And that's why Srila Prabhupada also said that your love for me will be shown by the way you cooperate with each other. So that's the bottom line, that we need to serve not uh, individually but collectively that is what pleases uh, Srila Prabhupada. That is what will please our Guru Vargas. That is what ultimately pleases Krishna. So. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very beautiful question. Very, very wonderful class. Very wonderful next. Uh, my question is like the same as the Mataji asked. Like, uh, the gopis, uh, they know what is the position of Krishna. And how come means like again they are loving him like as a lover and again like uh, remembering again his position, he is the husband of goddess of fortune. So it's kind of uh, hard to understand. Because Yashoda Mai with a stick he will beat him and like that she will not, she will not say like you are a husband of God is of origin like that. Mm. Yeah, so can you explain a little bit? Why the gopis are referring to Krishna as the husband of the goddess of fortune? Yes, Mataji. Okay, okay. Well, um, see because it is explained actually in the next chapter itself, um, chapter 32. Um, it is explained that when Krishna appears in front of the gopis, he actually first comes as Lord Vishnu. He manifests in the four-handed form of Lord Vishnu. <clears throat> and when the gopis see Lord Vishnu, they actually say, oh, no, 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 you go, bring our Shamasundara, bring Krishna, two-handed form. We don't want to see you. The gopis very well know what the hierarchy is. You know, that um, Vishnu comes from Krishna and uh, Lakshmi Devi, that she is actually 
the husband of the goddess of uh, I mean, she I mean she is the wife of the supreme personality of Godhead Lord Vishnu um, the gopis know that very well so who Krishna is you know they know that Krishna is his is their property the Lakshmi Devi is actually uh, the wife of one of the expansions of Krishna so then don't feel threatened you know like in the mundane sense if we see that you know a wife can actually tolerate everything but she cannot tolerate that you know there's another woman in her husband's life right I think that's the purpose of your question if I'm correct ah uh, yes right okay so but the gopis they are not threatened by Lakshmi Devi or understanding the fact or knowing the fact that you know Lakshmi Devi is actually the wife of the Supreme Person they know that very well but they're not threatened by it the reason being that they know that Krishna is theirs and they are Krishna's that each and every one of the gopis is very secure in their own individual relationship with Krishna Although the gopis also know that Krishna loves Srimati Radharani the most, and they are always, you know, looking for opportunities how they can unite the divine couple together. But whenever Krishna comes to them, also they feel very, very nice. They feel that yes, Krishna has come to me. Lalita also is very, very happy when Krishna comes and dances with her. But she knows that Krishna is dancing with me. But Krishna is also there with Srimati Radharani. They know for a fact that you know Krishna treats each and every one of the gopis according to their, you know, um, according to their um, liking. They know that very well. So therefore, they feel very, very secure. They don't feel threatened that okay, if Krishna loves me, if he loves that other girl, then you know his love for me will be less. No, because they know the absolute nature of Krishna. That they know that Krishna is all expanding. That you know his love is never ending. That even though Krishna not only has relationship with just the gopis or Lakshmi Devi, but Krishna has relationship with even each and every you know atom in the universe in the creation. Krishna has unique relationship with each and every one of them. Still, they are not threatened by. Krishna's relationship with everybody else because they know that their relationship with Krishna is unique. That is the glory of a spiritual relationship. You know why would um, you know why is it said that when you know Lord Chaitanya when he was in the Mahaprakash Leela when Mahaprabhu gave special mercy to Murari um, to Murari and um, you know, uh, he was he was you know giving so much mercy to every particular devotee. But when every devotee was going and receiving the mercy from Lord Chaitanya, everybody else who was witnessing that mercy, they were all being very happy for the one who was receiving the mercy. None of them were thinking that oh, what did Murari do? Oh, what did Kulavacha Shridhar do to do this? I am doing much more better service. Why am I not getting this mercy from Krishna? You know, I should also get from Lord Chaitanya. I should also get this mercy. I am much better than this Kulavacha Shridhar. Nobody was thinking like that. Everybody was rather thinking, Oh, look at Kulavacha Shridhar. Look at Murari. Look at the way they are getting all this mercy. And Lord Chaitanya made the declaration that day. He said that all of you are getting special mercy because all of you were having so much love for each and every devotee when they were getting their mercy. Each and every one of you had, none of you felt threatened when everyone else was receiving the mercy. So all of you have received the same kind of mercy that any one individual has received tonight. Mahaprabhu declared this. When Lord Chaitanya embraced Srila Rupa Goswami, all the devotees were in ecstasy that Mahaprabhu was giving his mercy to Rupa Goswami. They were blissful. And Lord Chaitanya declared that this, 
you know, embrace that I'm giving to Rupa Goswami, the same effect will be there for each and every one of you because you are happy in the mercy that the other devotee is getting. Same with Maharaj Pratap Rudra. So Lord Chaitanya taught with his actions that how we need to be happy when any other devotee is receiving the mercy. Then we will be the recipient of the same kind of mercy that that devotee is receiving. But if we feel anything other than happy, then the mercy deflects. We don't receive the mercy. The mercy just goes away from us. That is the thing. So we need to always feel secure, even while we serve senior Vaishnavas or when we serve our Guru Vargas. We should know that, yes, there are certain devotees who are very expert in serving the Guru Vargas. And if we can assist them in their service, that our lives, you know, that way we will also be able to receive that same kind of mercy. It is not about, you know, doing less or doing more. It's about doing the best to our own individual capacity, what we can do. So therefore, we should never feel threatened that, oh, that person has too much access to guru, or that person is always, you know, oh, the guru calls them, or oh, the guru is having this relationship with them. Look at me, I am not getting anything. No. Rather, if we can serve such devotees and, you know, be happy for them, then trust me, one day or the other, that same fortune will come to even to us. We'll get the same kind of mercy. We will get the same kind of mercy. So it's all about having the feeling of security which the gopis had. They never felt that anybody else is threatening their relationship with Krishna because they knew that my relationship with Krishna is unique. And that Krishna has unique relationship with each and every living entity. So why feel threatened? Does that answer your question? Yes, Mataji. Very nice. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice question. Thank you. <laughs> 